Hello everyone, this is Kylie, and welcome to my version of the Personal Lifebook Senior Project. This assignment was to find 20 pictures through my life with 100 word captions explaining each of them, so approximately 2,000 words total. While I am reading this from a written script for my teacher, I decided to do this in my own way and narrate my life through video footage. After all, it's pretty much what I've already been doing on my channel. So I've gathered up 20 items, or rather 20 stories of my life that I feel are much more significant to creating the person I am now more than writing a paragraph about a picture showing how great my trip to Belize was when I was 7. Some of these clips are taken from old videos on my channel and some are new footage to fill the space from my life before YouTube, so here we go. Enjoy! Number 1. Lola's Garden my whole life, I've had a fascination with fairies and mythological creatures. My mom and I shared a passion of collecting books about fairies, little statues of fairies to sit around the house, and even small fairy doors lining the edge of every wall on the floor of every room. As a toddler, I was raised by my Lola, Tagalog for Grandma, and at her house I would scour the backyard for small creatures, but I would only end up bringing her wild onions to her doorstep. She had little gnomes that stood at the base of a particular tree. My Lola used to say they came to life and ran around when we weren't looking, and my uncle even wrote a story about it, how he caught one in a jar. Number two, my fairy club. I considered myself a nature spirit, and around the time from first to about fourth grade, I led a fairy club where after school my friends and I would build little things for fairies to play with at night in a small canopy of trees stretching over a fence in the play yard. I made stories about the pixies being the malevolent fairies that lived in the thorn bushes across the field, and the fairies were our allies, so we helped them. I climbed this one tree by the fence that I could reach the top of and view the whole playground, but by the time I came down I was always covered in sticky pine sap that barely washed off with soap and water the first time. I still loved climbing trees, and I still do to this day. Number 3. My Cousin's Woods Later on, by the time I was roughly nine, my cousin and I would hang out and run into the woods in her backyard and disappear for hours. We always found the same spot deep in the forest where we found all kinds of old miscellaneous items like bottles, lost watches, abandoned bikes and lawnmowers, and even an overturned ice cream cart. Everything looked as if it was left there from the 60s at least, but in reality, most of our treasures were probably only five years old. We built a structure around a few trees made of sticks, branches, and leaves and called it our escape. I have no idea what it looks like now, but I imagine the regrowth would make it unrecognizable as what it used to be, a child's safe haven. Number 4. Nature by my house. With being a nature lover my whole life, moving on from my Lola's backyard to my elementary school's play yard, and from my cousin's backyard as well, being that she eventually moved away to college, I found myself a new nature nook right at the end of my street. Since I was little, whenever I passed this corner sidewalk, I always noticed a fence separating pedestrians from a large drop into a small stream, running off pebbles and uneven concrete slabs from a storm drain. In 2015, my best friend Kat and I were exploring in my neighborhood. We always thought it was a cool looking area, but passing by once, we stumbled across a clear entrance to the site. We walked down the path and discovered the beauty it held from within. Ever since then, I have gone to that spot whenever I need to clear my head or just soak in nature without going too far from home. It's a beautiful spot to take pictures or chat with friends. Up the street from that location, I also frequently went to a larger section of woods where I even claimed my favorite sitting tree and brought all my nature-loving friends whenever I could. Number 5. My Jewelry Business My mom has always been the most creative and experimental person I've ever known. She has always scrapbooked and made beautiful cards for holidays and pretty much everything you can make a card for. She even made a card every night and put it in my lunchbox every day for lunch at school. Back when I was in fourth grade, I decided to pick up some of her beads and wire tools and started putting together charms and attaching them to naked earring backs. I loved doing it and eventually I made more than I could wear, so I started to make necklaces and bracelets too. 
I started to sell them to family friends and schoolmates so much that I even had custom jewelry order forms that you could fill out to even have me make you something. I continued this little jewelry business up until about 8th grade when I started to lose interest in working with jewelry because it wasn't my style to wear any of those things anymore. By that time, I had made so much money from it, I lived off of my jewelry business stash all the way up until about a year ago and then I got a job. It was a really fun part of my life and I could make jewelry again if I wanted to because I remember how I'm just so busy with new hobbies that I never went back to it. Number six, my dad traveling. From about the age of five to twelve my dad went overseas on contracts. He would come home on holidays and we would get frequent phone calls, emails, and letters of course. Something I remember from those times was the photos he would send me of all the places he went. On the first trip out, when I was packing up his bags, I gave my dad a little toy, smaller than his palm, of a dog he named Ralphie. Everywhere he went, he would take a picture, and somewhere in the photo, he hid Ralphie for me to find. Ralphie was a celebrity among my dad's friends overseas, and now he sits on a shelf next to my fishbowl. It was quite a small memory from my childhood, but sometimes the little things mean the most, like a little McDonald's toy that traveled the world. 7. Horror Movies Contrary to the fun I had spreading the awareness that fairies exist, I also had a darker side to me. Even at the age of 4, I was obsessed with horror movies like The Ring, The Messengers, The Others, The Grudge, Pet Cemetery. you get the idea. I still think Interview with a Vampire is one of the greatest movies ever. Only books I wouldn't refuse to read were all of those scary stories by Alvin Schwartz. They scared the crap out of me, but at the same time, I was so obsessed. Growing up, I was also one of the first of my friends to discover the Monster High dolls made by Mattel. I collected all the originals and more, and regularly played the games on their site. It's not a surprise I ended up falling into a fashion scene that revolved around fishnets, hot topic shopping, fingerless gloves, and band t-shirts. The music I grew up with. I liked all kinds of music through my childhood. My mom and I jammed out to boy bands like NSYNC, New Kids on the Block, to Enrique Iglesias, Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, Selena Gomez. While completely random, I can also never forget Brian Adams. From my dad's side, I had influences like Guns N' Roses, Seether, Aerosmith, a lot more I can't even think of right now. Around middle school, I developed my own favorite sounds. I stuck to neon trees at first, then I fell in love with All American Rejects, they're still a really awesome band. And at the peak of my wannabe emo phase, I worshipped bands like Black Veil Bride, Sleeping With Sirens, Asking Alexandria, Bring Me The Horizon, Alisana, many, many more. Number 9, my first Warped Tour. I listened to a lot of screamo bands, and in the summer of 2014, I attended my first Warped Tour. One of the most memorable moments was meeting Brian Stars, Johnny Gilbert, Damon Fizzy, and Seer, but the other memorable moment was my first mosh pit. Falling in Reverse was not my favorite band at the time, but I knew their music pretty well, so I found myself standing in the middle of the crowd which for most people who are experienced at concerts know that if you're in the middle of a concert, you're most likely going to end up in a pit. My first ever concert was a Jonas Brothers concert, so of course I didn't know this. Long story short, I had a lot of fun in the pit, but my dad, observing from a distance, thought I was in trouble, so he ran in the middle and grabbed my elbows and started making me defend myself. I yelled over the music trying to explain to him that this was normal and this was fun, so he went back to watching me just to make sure I didn't get hurt. Number 10 the way moshing made me feel. Cheesy, I know. After my first warp Tour, I went back the next two years following. I had just broken my arm, which I will get into later, but it caused me to not be able to mosh at 2015 Warped. The next year, I moshed quite a bit, but the best pit ever was the one to one of my favorite bands, Chelsea Grin. A lot of people would wonder why I enjoy thrashing around my body in a sea of sweaty men and kicking up dirt, stirring in the air, sticking to the sweat on my body that wasn't even mine. It's really because it was the only place I felt like I didn't have to care about being too loud or getting too dirty. I didn't worry about other people seeing me or being put on the spot because we were all on the spot. We were all in the same boat. And feeling as united as a group of strangers sharing an energy over booming bass and a crowd of surfing bodies was amazing. While Warped Tour is an exceptional place, I have to give credit to the best crowd I've ever moshed in. 
March 31st, 2017 was my current boyfriend's band, Trivial Difference, playing in a basement with some other bands that night. In the flashing colorful lights, I moshed like I didn't care. Half the time I was even holding a camera, and people from my school stood along the side, which I'd usually be self-conscious about. But knowing all the music, watching boys I personally knew and loved play so well that night, there was no rush like it. 11. Why my name is Jellyfish. Back during freshman year, when I was at the height of my emo phase, I started doing what every other emo YouTuber did, which was cutting my own hair. All choppy and layered, of course. The first time I cut it, it actually looked pretty interesting. It was a success, but for some reason the next day, I kept going with the scissors. I tried to cut my own layers and got a little carried away, and I ended up cutting all of my hair really short, but kept the under parts of my hair really long in one length. I ended up looking like a jellyfish, and a lot of people liked to point it out constantly until I finally grew it out. I decided to own my mistake and put the name in my bio as Kylie the Jellyfish. My username at the time was at hi underscore its underscore Kylie. And since I thought that was a really plain username, I decided to switch my profile name and my username I created and came up with Kylie dot the dot jellyfish and eventually created a YouTube channel with the same name. So as my following grew, I became known as this unique name. Jellyfish is not my favorite animal, which is a misconception many people just assume. They are pretty cool though because they have no bones, brains, and they are considered the world's only immortal animal because of how they regenerate themselves infinitely until they are killed by other natural causes. Pretty cool. Number 12. Being an only child. The best way that I can describe my personality in one phrase is simply only child. If you have ever heard of only child syndrome, you will know that depending on if you were raised as the oldest, middle, last, or only child, it can explain a lot about your personality. I'm basically really good at doing individual things and entertaining myself. I'm not too social and I personally enjoy alone time more than being around others for long periods of time. With my dad working overseas for the majority of my elementary years, it was just me and my mom in the house, like Gilmore Girls style, for comparison. I do technically have an older half-brother and half-sister, but the reason I still consider myself an only child, though I have siblings, is because they were out of high school by the time I was born. I grew up with them being more like an aunt and uncle in a way. Most people are shocked when I mention that I have a brother or sister because they were never really a consistent part of my life. My brother lived close when I was younger, so he stopped by to say hi often, but as I got older, my sister started dedicating special days to bond with me and do some fun things which we call sister days. This brings me to the story of my hair. Number 13, dyeing my hair. My special sister days were usually celebrated on my birthday, and for my 14th birthday, my sister decided to dye my hair for the first time. The next year, she took me to get it done by her friend professionally. After that point, I loved coloring my hair. The next year, my friend helped me dye my hair black, and after that, it kind of became a regular thing. April sophomore year, for my 16th birthday, I dyed my full head teal as the first really shocking color. After that, I tried about every color you can think of in between then and now. I plan on making a full separate video about my entire hair timeline in depth, but this was just really how I got started. Ever since then, my obsession with color has only grown. The fundamentals of color have such an impact on me and are a big part of all the things I want to consider as a career. So dyeing my hair and expressing myself through color is just a really big part of who I am now. 14. My Common Art Concepts My whole life I've considered myself an artist over other things. I have a passion to create. I play with organic shapes, colors, and many different forms of art and styles. I like to challenge people's comfort with my art, which is why there are certain things I put into many of my art pieces for thought-out reasons. I've always had an obsession with deer, antlers, and horns. I realize that I can relate to deer because my personality is similar to that of a deer's mannerisms. Skittish while graceful, sensitive and gentle, scatterbrained, nimble-minded, and I would also consider myself more as prey than a predator. I also like that horned and antlered animals wear their garment of protection like a crown. It's beautiful and I find significance enough to include that in my art. I would also consider myself a moth for other reasons, like how I feel more awake at night, I am attracted to heat like a moth to flame, and they're delicate to the touch. Number 15. My purpose as an artist. I often like to draw portraits of girls. While I acknowledge the balance of feminine and masculine energy in nature, I think I find most nature I'm drawn to is a feminine energy. 
I draw girls because I'm better at understanding anatomy more similar to mine. I often draw girls that are not completely human. Going back to the obsession that I've always had with mythological creatures, I love creating human-animal hybrids. Many people also ask why I've never been afraid of drawing nudity in my art. I honestly do this for many reasons. One of the reasons is because drawing clothes is just really hard, and I also find so much beauty in the skin tones covering the entire body and how organic it is. I am a feminist supporter of Free the Nipple, and I also feel like putting uncensored nudity in unsexualized art is my contribution to conditioning and desensitizing the society to be okay with what's only natural. It's also where my fascination with flowers, overgrowth on bones, bodily decay, and reincarnation come in. It's always been a vision of mine that when you die, you give yourself back to earth completely, and life like flowers and greenery can flourish from that. Number 16, my first YouTube channel. Not sure exactly how to start this cringy story, but once upon a time I had a best friend named Kat, and for our 8th grade science project we had to create a video which we chose to make inspired by Slenderman. This is where you can see exactly why I've never decided to pursue a career in acting, but regardless of how our video ended up, it was still really fun to make, so we decided to make more. We created a channel called Kaylee Productions, a mixture of both of our names. We made only like four videos on that channel and a few others on her channel, but that was my first experience with being on YouTube. The reason why this is so significant is because I'm not sure I would have kicked off on my YouTube channel as early as I did, which is now more successful than I ever imagined, so really thankful for my cringy young self being brave and getting out there when I did. Number 17, Cheerleading. Apart from going to dance in gymnastics camps every summer since I was a child and trying ballet and tap for only about two months, I never was a sporty person. I was the worst at competitive sports where there were fields or balls or running involved. In eighth grade, I tried out for my middle school's Panther cheer team and got in. The coach happened to be my avid tutor and was hunting me down to join the previous year. Since my school didn't have a football team, we were a competitive cheer team. I was a flyer because I was small and whenever I wasn't in the air, I was a front spot. It was pretty fun, so that summer I joined the coach's little league football sideline travel team. We were the Colts. I became the captain and loved the team so much because of how small it was. Then I joined my high school's cheer team and became a JV flyer. The next year, I even went back to help assist coach the Colts for fun and became a JV captain for my high school team my sophomore year. Then I had an expectation of joining varsity the next year, so I started training in a private gym to improve my tumbling. I had my front and back walkovers, but right when I finally got my back handspring unassisted, I decided to start taking extra classes with a new coach. She had me do back handsprings on my own down a wedge mat, and with the weight from my own body, I snapped my radius and ulna, the middle of my right forearm completely folded at an angle. It was the most traumatic experience I had ever had. To this day, I still can't stand watching people break bones. I freak out so much and my body hurts thinking about it. The nerve damage was so bad I had little feeling in my pinky for the next four months and I was in a cast for about seven weeks. After that healed, I didn't rejoin cheer, but during season, I currently coach a little league football team's sideline cheerleaders all around the ages of five to 14. It keeps me involved enough that I can still say I'm a cheerleader. Being a cheerleader made me more confident, physically aware, and taught me how to lead, so I'm pretty happy it was a part of my life. 18. The Cats in My Neighborhood Let's start off this story with establishing the fact that my whole life I have been very allergic to cats, dogs, and rodents. I've always loved animals, but they make me so itchy. I always had fish as pets as a result, and I had two guinea pigs for a while. The summer in between third and fourth grade, a little gray and white kitten with big green eyes showed up, just chilling under my deck. I fell in love with her cute little face immediately, but knowing that I am allergic, I knew I would never be able to keep her. She ended up never leaving and grew really attached to my family, so we started to feed her. With a young female cat around, of course there were male cats soon to come. Ellie, which is what I named the gray and white cat, seemed to attract many cats in the neighborhood. We gave them various names like Lord Voldemort, Tom Cruise, Kiwi, and Romeo. We got Ellie fixed as a result, but soon after that she got sideswept by a car broke her pelvis into two pieces and we had to keep her as an indoor cat despite how allergic we were. There was another female cat that came around the neighborhood eventually and we named her girlfriend. She was a dark tortoise shell cat that eventually ended up getting pregnant multiple times. Her first litter was eaten by foxes. Out of the second litter I became very close to all the kittens and ended up giving two of them away to friends before the rest of them were eaten by foxes as well. The most recent litter never got eaten and they are all about two years old living on our deck. 
I could talk all day about each of the cats in detail because, trust me, I want to, but there's just so much to say about them. I love these cats and I never want to forget how much joy they brought my family. Number 19. Ukulele. I've had many hobbies in my life, but I never was very musical. I loved being in chorus in elementary school, and when I reached middle school, I joined the Coralettes in All Women's Choir. After that, I was not musical at all until my friend Raphael invited me to his ukulele club and offered to teach me. He taught me the first four chords I ever knew, and after that, I borrowed my ex-boyfriend's brother's ukulele and taught myself at home online. I started doing covers and singing for my friends, and many people were surprised that I had a voice, and after all the years, I kind of forgot I could sing too. I started posting covers on Instagram and eventually accumulated 38 ukulele videos on my YouTube channel at this point. I've been playing for about a year and a half now, and I'm probably better at singing than the strumming, but it still makes me so happy I continue to do it. It keeps a lighter edge to me, and it's a great way to warm up to a crowd of friends when they're bored. Number 20. Finally. My passion for documenting my life. Some of my friends can back me up on this one. I have really bad memory. I'm pretty sure it's a part of my ADD, but for some reason, a lot of things slip my mind easily and I'm the worst at multitasking. Therefore, I'm constantly making lists for myself to follow, jotting down thoughts on sticky pads and leaving them all over my room, and I'm constantly recording dates to never forget the best of times. A big part of why I love YouTube is that it serves as my public journal. If I don't remember the last time I went to the beach, I can look through my vlogs, or if I need to remember how I achieved a previous makeup look, I can look back to my old makeup tutorials. Watching all my videos helps me remember exactly when I had what hair color too. It's happened multiple times where I see a picture I can't remember exactly when it was taken, so I look at my hair color, look back to the first video or picture I posted with it on Instagram, and then I have myself a time frame. It's not only convenient, but it's really important to me. A lot of people delete so much of their Instagram content because it makes their feed look cleaner, I guess. If you ever scroll through my accounts, you will see that I rarely keep themes. I just post a lot of selfies to document my hair and makeup at the time, usually fill the captions with what's been happening in my life recently, and I never delete old photos of friendships, important events, and even past relationships, which sometimes can be the struggle trying to explain why I don't delete pictures of me with other people I'm no longer with. It's honestly because even if things are aren't the same now, I don't want to forget that one time in my life. I want to have a solid respect for everything that's happened to me in my life with preserving all the memories as they were. Memories are like gold to me. This is why I put so much effort into making this project too. This is almost like my form of the Draw My Life Challenge, but I have to be honest, the whole time I've been recording this, it seems to be more like 13 Reasons Why. I mean, that show was phenomenally done, but don't worry, I'm not hinting at any dark warnings. I'm fine. I guess this is about it. That was 20 stories or items of my life explained as briefly as I'm willing to make it. I hope you feel like you know me a little better or you were at least a bit entertained by the old pictures and montages of my recycled footage. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Stay epic. Bye.